All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this hot Michigan night. And of course, I know many of you are joining us from other locations. Hopefully, you're having better weather, though, given some of you are in Florida. I doubt it. Um, is there any way to kill the, the sound of people joining? Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. I'm working on it. Cool. Very cool. All right. So um, thank you again. Um, as has been the ha issue since we've moved to remote Cranbrook, we've got people here on WebEx. We've got people in our chat room, our people on YouTube. So we can't do the full roll call, roll call but um, very grateful to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, start things off with um, In the News and In the Sky, and Dale Teamy is our guest presenter tonight, and he is presenting all the way from Pensacola, Florida. Sorry, uh, I muted everybody, so. Yeah, I'm, uh, there you go, Dale. I get caught up here. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see. Okay. I'm still looking for ways to turn off the joining okay. sound. I'm uh I need to share, right? Here we go. Okay. What are we seeing? See your screen. You see your PowerPoint, your main PowerPoint window. You might need it if you're presenting. You need to choose the. Uh, the other uh, option, maybe, or just share your whole screen. Yeah, hold on a sec. Or just start presentation. I think that'll be it. No, he did start the presentation. WebEx is not uh, the best at at that. Yeah. Still doing that, eh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing you could try, uh, so, um, like if you go up to the, there you okay. there we go, perfect. Okay. Beautiful. You're seeing anybody's uh, boxes in there? Nope. Okay, because I'm seeing like four people on my screen. <laughs> okay. Well, in the news for July 6, 2020. Astronomers have detected a black hole colliding with an object that might be the largest neutron star ever detected, or the smallest black hole. Most neutron stars we know of weigh in at about two suns or less, and the vast majority of stellar mass black holes contain five solar masses or more. Evidence for anything in between is scant, and astronomers don't anticipate finding anything in this mass gap between the two categories. Except now, the LIGO Virgo team has announced the detection of GW 190814, an event wherein a 23 solar mass black hole merged with a something of 2.6 solar masses. Although the observations are inconclusive, some researchers presently lean towards a black hole solution for the 2.6 solar mass object. If it were a neutron star, it was eaten in one bite, like a Pac-Man swallowing a dot. Even so, it's hard to model how such a mismatched pair would have come together in the first place. Meanwhile, the spin graph of the binary has another surprise. It appears a larger black hole wasn't spinning at all. In short, GW190814 challenges all astrophysical paradigms, mass gap, formation scenarios, and merger rates. It'll be interesting to see where the study of it goes from here. 
For the first time, a ground-based observatory has detected interacting exoplanets. This discovery came from the SOFI instrument at Observatoire de Haute-Provence, which studied the exoplanetary system WASP-148. Uh, they're not publishing in our magazine, are they? SOFI's team examined the star's motion and concluded that it hosted two planets, WASP-148b and WASP-148c. That the two planets were strongly interacting has been confirmed from other data. Whereas the first planet, WASP-148b, orbits the star in nearly nine days, the second one takes four times longer. This ratio between the orbital periods implies that the WASP-148 system is close to resonance, meaning that there is enhanced gravitational interaction between the two planets. What started out as a hunt for ice lurking in polar lunar craters turned into an unexpected finding that could help clear some muddy history about the moon's formation. Team members of the miniature radio frequency, MINI-RF, instrument on NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, spacecraft, found new evidence that the moon's subsurface might be richer in metals like iron and titanium than researchers thought. That finding, published July 1st in Earth and Planetary Science Letters, could aid in drawing a clearer connection between Earth and the Moon. The team emphasizes that the new study can't directly answer the outstanding questions about the Moon's formation, but it does reduce the uncertainty in the distribution of iron and titanium oxides in the lunar subsurface and provide critical evidence needed to better understand the Moon's formation and its connection to Earth. It really raises the question of what this means for our previous formation hypotheses, said one of the team members. Finally, this month offers a bonanza of Mars missions, with the US, China, and the United Arab Emirates all scheduled for liftoff. July starts a launch window for NASA's Perseverance rover, China's uh, Tianwen-1, which combines an orbiter, lander, and rover, and the UAE's HOPE orbiter. HOPE will be launched on a Japanese rocket and will spend at least two years studying the Martian atmosphere. It will be the first mission of its kind by any Arab nation. Now in the sky for, well, tonight. Look at this comet. Neowise, now an empty binocular, now an easy binocular object is seen here from San Leandro, California, in a composite image captured around 4.45 in the morning. Neowise, also known as Comet C2020F3, is not yet a great comet like Hale-Bopp or West, though some observers with pristine skies have reported seeing it naked eye. Comet C2020 F3, Neowise, is up at dawn now and should remain in the dawn sky until July 11th if it's not hiding behind rain clouds. Then it will temporarily disappear below the horizon while making a transition to the early evening sky, becoming visible again in the evening around July 15 through 16. Here's a depiction of where it would have been this morning from the central U.S. And here's where it should be tomorrow, the 7th. Look for a bright star capella in the northeast and find these other visible stars below it, and Kalanen and Mahasim. The comet should be right about there. If you wake up early to hunt Neowise, you can catch Venus as the skins past Aldebaran in Taurus. It will be closest on the 11th and 12th, passing with one degree of the red star. Meanwhile, Jupiter and Saturn both reach opposition this year or month, while Mars is making a better and better showing with a disk that passes the 12 minute, 12 second mark tomorrow on the 7th. And that is in the sky and in the news for July 6th. Yeah. Back to you, Diane. All right, thank you, Dale. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some uh, observing reports. I did receive at least one to read, but uh, 
hopefully somebody has got some neo wise to report later in the meeting so now that we've got uh, in the news in the sky wrapped up we will move into the officer reports as your president um <laughs> obviously this has not been a normal month with the normal normal summer with the activities that we look forward to however i want to remind you all that our picnic is still on the books um at wolcott mill metro park in its usual place at the shelter there by the creek um we are hoping to be able to pull off a safe socially distanced picnic in august jonathan um the date is the 22nd 22nd yes it's so the august, uh, 50th anniversary of the first open house at Cranbrook or, or at, at stargate yeah. yes it's, uh it's it's the same weekend i believe i think the actual 50th anniversary is monday yeah so we had originally made the choice to move the picnic to august to coincide with the stargate anniversary and in retrospect that looks like it might have been a good choice so um stay tuned we will have full information on the picnic um next month but just keep in mind everything else has been canceled but right now picnic is on and yes you will still have to bring a side dish to pass um so the the normal things that officers provide will be provided so we will do grilling there will be vegetarian options we will have pop we will have um uh, hopefully um not just chips so some years we had too many bags of doritos but yeah. <laughs> no beer we can't have beer at that park um yeah leave the beer at home <laughs> and and if it is good weather we will hopefully get some safe socially distance observer observing in now um I believe that we are not planning to spread this far and wide to the public the way that we have recent club picnics. I believe we are keeping it as an in-house event, though, of course, members of other astronomy clubs are welcome. As ever, just don't bring 15 members of your extended family because we're going to keep it on a more intimate scale. Um, and we the board members are planning to make plan A for a normal banquet on the second Thursday of December and plan B as a backup plan to enact in the event that we cannot meet safely on site at a banquet hall. So we are going to try to make the second half of this year as enjoyable as possible for everybody. In the meantime, we'll continue to have our virtual meetings, virtual open houses, and in the event of inclement weather, weather virtual discussion groups. So stay tuned. And Diane, I'd like to pass. Yes. Diane, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, are, if you're going to have observing, isn't that going to be contaminating or risking contaminating lenses? We talked about that yeah. before, and I think that's I think not so. a good idea. And well, then also, the other thing is, if you're passing food around, that's a risk of contamination right there the uh it would definitely be a no uh sharing uh telescopes observing if we yes don't. Ah, okay um, we, although so far so far it does seem you know so far studies seem to suggest that sharing food is safe um yeah the touch is not a major uh vector for it um but obviously we're I don't know. I wouldn't get your hopes too high. Uh, somebody could set happen, up a somebody, bring your own food. Yeah, yeah bring your yeah. own food. But also, I think uh, you could set up a a TV uh, viewer and then look at pictures uh, from the computer screen rather than through the telescope eyepiece. I mean, one thing we could do is have dedicated servers serving food uh, if we wanted to avoid sharing uh, common utensils or something. Right. I mean, awesome. so far. You know, things have gone for three months with restaurants being able to carry out safely. Outdoor dining seems to be fairly safe. Indoor dining, bars, yes, those are problems. Um, and sharing telescopes is a no no. We are going to ask that if anybody partakes in observing, no sharing telescopes, no swapping eyepieces, 
simply use the site, enjoy the site, enjoy the camaraderie, right? Apart, and yeah, no, no touching. No three millimeter plazos allowed. <laughs> yeah, you can have no three millimeter plazo all night long. Just I don't want to see it. Okay, um, officer reports are really not. Um, that was an excellent question, Alan. But if anybody else has any questions. Please save them for the snack break or mail the board so we can take that up as a board thing because we do have a very um, intense program of activities tonight and I'd like to get through the officer reports. So I'd like to pass things over to Dr. Dale Parton, our first vice president, to let us know how things are going on the program front. Thank you, Diane. Um, <clears throat> well, our <clears throat> in the near future, on July 16, uh, Jonathan Cade will have a presentation entitled Interstellar Objects I Have Sort of Known. Almost wonder if he ought to change that to I Have Known and Loved or something like that. <laughs> um, on August the 3rd, Jeff McLeod will have the main presentation. Uh, his title is The Moon is Not Boring and other lunar misconceptions. And then on that same day, John Blum will have a short presentation entitled The Best Online and Offline Resources for Astronomers. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'm looking for speakers for early next year. Uh, if anyone has something you're considering, by uh, giving a presentation on either a long presentation or a short one, uh, please let me know. Uh, another thing we uh, are considering is having some panel discussions. Um, and I will read you uh, one list of possible topics that have been suggested. If you would be interested in participating in a panel, discussing one of these topics, uh, let me know. Uh, Diane, do I have time to read the list? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, six topics. First would be, should we try to communicate with extraterrestrial civilizations? Or would it be an invitation to disaster from a superior opportunistic alien power. Uh, secondly, will we have contact with intelligent extraterrestrial life in the next 100 years? Then visual observation versus imaging. Another would be, should Pluto still be called a planet? Um, then go to versus push to versus manually controlled telescopes. And finally, astronomy related movies. Or we're open to additional suggestions, especially from people who would be interested in participating in a panel uh, with your suggestion. Um, so that's that's my report. If If you, would like to contact me, uh, you can send an email, get your pen or pencil ready. You, you can go to the, to the Warren Club website and go to the listing of officers and there's, you can click on something next to my name that will send me an email. Or my email address is firstvp, as in first vice president, firstvp, at warrenastro.org. Be happy to hear from you if you'd like to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. And uh, now I'll turn things over to our second vice president, Riyadh. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everyone. Um, the observatory is in good shape. All the equipment are uh, fine. Uh, same thing with the dab shed. Uh, last I visited, the observatory was uh, on the 17th. I intend to uh, take another trip out there in a couple of weeks before the next uh, meeting this month. 
Um, so, so far, everything is good. We don't have any leaks. We don't have any building problems. Uh, all the equipment is fine. And of course, just to rem remind everyone, the uh, observatory uh, building is still closed. Uh, although if you want to go out and do some observing, maybe uh, during the day, daytime or until um, about nine o'clock or so, uh, if there's something to see at that point, uh, you're welcome to do that. Recent uh, information I have received is that um, the Camp Rotary may be closing at about uh, nine o'clock every day because they're trying to keep uh, people from going out there and camping at night since uh, it's no longer open for camping during the COVID. Uh, 19 issue uh so that will probably be uh i'm sure uh changed once we have that uh, resolved but in the meantime uh, this is what we would have to deal with and if you go out there and the ranger asks you to leave please uh, comply and let them know that you're with the Warren astronomical society if they let you stay fine if not please comply with uh, their request uh, other than that everything's still fine like i said and um Hopefully, uh, one day soon, we'll all be uh, getting back together there again. That's all I have. Thank you, Riyadh. And we'll pass things down to our secretary, Glenn Wilkins. Longer of excuses for not doing minutes because we have WebEx, and I was able to do it from uh, Florida with no problem at all. So the, the uh, minutes are in the current WASP. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Glenn is also digging into our list of beg letters so that we hope to have, and we're not sure the mechanism, a great um, door prize selection this year at the banquet. If we have a, if we have a socially distanced banquet, we're going to get creative with how you pick them and how we'll come to you, but we will cross that bridge in November. So thank you, Glenn, and let's pass things to Mark as our treasurer. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, Treasurer's report for the end of June. We have 84 current members. Um, so far this year, we've taken in $1,876. We've spent $510. And we have $22,913 in total assets as of the end of the month. All the details are in the loss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And now let's go to Bob for outreach. Hi there, everyone. Um, well, let's see, member spotlight, Doug Bach gave a presentation to the Seven Ponds Club. How'd that go, Doug? Here. You're fine. <laughs> no, it went real well. Um, had a few questions and uh, enjoyed the, uh, the group uh, gathering. Um, John Lyons happened to come in from Colorado and was uh, social distancing with six people over at Doug Bauer's place. They watched on the big screen while uh, I was doing my presentation. So it was it was fun. We had about uh, I'd say 15 or 18 people. Thank you. So um, if you are giving uh, presentations to anyone, uh, just let me know so I can uh, record that in the next newsletter. Um, GLAC uh, information, astronomy at the beach, or the, the GLAC minutes are in the WASP. Astronomy at the beach uh, is going to be online this year. We've, uh, we've, we've, the board has decided they're going to do it that way. So we are looking to uh, uh, offer some pre recorded presentations, and we're going to have uh, members of our clubs, GLAC member clubs, uh, give uh, online presentations just like we're doing here. So uh, if you have anything you'd like to present, get that to me and I'll, I'll forward that on to the GLAC board. And uh, I know I, uh, <laughs> I stayed after the last GLAC meeting, I stayed online and uh, showed Jeff uh, uh, a tour of the solar system, a mini version of what I, I showed here. And he's like, you got to show that. And I'm like, uh -huh, I'm going to. So uh, anybody have any, anything they'd like to show, please do. Um, 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 um. I am updating uh, the GLAC website right now, and one of the things I suggested uh, to the GLAC board was, we, we don't have a page with information on the member clubs. And I said, go ahead and do that. Great, so I'll go ahead and doing that. And um, I'm, I'm adding them in. And uh, let's see, GLAC now has a YouTube channel. Everybody should go and subscribe to it so that I can give it a nice uh, URL, uh, one of the nice named uh, URLs. So yeah, just GL. 
AAC on YouTube. Go ahead and subscribe. Thank you. You can also put that in the um, chat, Bob, for the benefit of everybody on WebEx. I will do that. Bob? Yes. Uh, this is Shedlowski. Uh, if anybody's interested, I'll be giving a, a rep presentation to Lowbrows on the 17th at 7.30. It's a repeat of the evolution of giant telescopes that I gave you guys uh, a couple years ago. So 17th at 7.30? I'll, I'll post that on the I.O. Uh, website if you want. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I, I uh, gave presentations to both the Low Brows and the Oakland Club over the last month as well. And, and the Low Brows, we appreciate those presentations and um, looking forward to them. Um, as Black President, um, basically backing up all the things, Bob has been doing a lot of work on getting the Black website up. Brian Autumn has been doing work as far as his. Uh, suggestions to how the presentation will go. And um, Jeff Copmanis has been doing a lot of work as well on the board. So um, we're, we are trying to remain active despite the fact that we're sticking with our guns and going online, um, just too much liability otherwise. Um, at Island Lake Park, there are a lot of people that go out there on a regular basis. So. I am anticipating having to make a statement to explain that if if Island Lake is open, why aren't we out there with our telescopes? So I'll be taking that on. That is so. greatly appreciated, Adrian. And uh, you have the support of the Warren Club in putting safety first. All right. okay, that's Anything else, Bob? Bridge. That's it. Very good. Let's pass things to Jonathan for publications. The uh, WASP is up. Uh, this issue is really exciting. Uh, Dale Teamy uh, got out his magical shoehorn and got uh, a lot of really interesting and different articles in. So I highly encourage you to check it out if you haven't gotten the chance yet. Uh, so I'll post the link in the chat here and on the uh, YouTube video as well. All right, that concludes the officer's reports. I believe we're missing one of our subgroup captains tonight. Um, since Solar Marty isn't here, I will share his favorite website with you. But I can tell you from looking at the data from SOHO, the solar telescope, there is nothing going on on the sun right now. Um, let me just share the content for one second. <laughs> Oh, I actually I think that depends on the instrument you use. Those of us using Coronados and H Alpha um, scopes have noticed a hedgerow prominence that's been on the sun um, for the last few days. So there are four prominences in a row that have um, been on one of the limbs of the sun. So there is activity, but unfortunately, it taking some expensive equipment to see that activity there. Okay. And there it goes. That's one of the prominences that's left. There were more of them in a row um, where that one prominence is showing up. So there had been some activity. It looks like it's starting to die down um, looking at. Um, so start jumping in, but um, yeah, solar observing was on the, over the last, uh, Week solar observing had been pretty interesting if you had the uh, equipment to do it. So very cool. Ahead. Sorry about that. Thank you for weighing in because I have not broken out my PST in quite some time. Um, okay. Uh, astrophotography, Bill let me know he's not going to be here tonight, but he's got the following to say. I hope with all of the clear skies that we've been having, you've been able to get outside and do some astrophotography, especially now since Jupiter and Saturn are shining so brilliantly and are so close together in the southeast sky. This is a great time to put your DSLR in the back of your telescope. You can even hold your iPhone up to the eyepiece to get a great shot of the planets. I encourage you to take photos of the planets and show them at our next online meeting. 
which would be our virtual Macomb meeting on the third Thursday of this month. If you have any astrophotography questions, contact Bill at B-E-E-Z-O-L-L -L at AOL.com. All right. Um, and I don't see Jeff and McLeod or discussion group, Captain, but discussion groups, of course, in the event of an inclement weather open house, we will convert the WebEx to a virtual discussion group. So they've been pretty much discussion groups anyhow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll just be official about it. Um, any and history group sub captain is here. Anything other than what's in the wasp, Dale? I know you've got a nice little report in the wasp. Nice big report, actually. Hey, All right. Um, sorry, Dale, you're still muted. I muted. I'm I'm muting everyone. Uh, there you go. Now okay. you're. Oh, okay. The uh, I've been busy scanning in the Detroit Astronomical Society newsletters I've found. Uh, I got nearly all the 1967 issues. There's only three missing, the March, April, and December issues. Interesting discoveries. Oh, they're also posted online on, on our website. So you can go to the WASP newsletter page and you can get a link to the DAS issues. Some discoveries I made was one, Gary Ross was editor of the Great Lakes chapter uh, of the Astronomical League newsletter, The Star in 67. He also delivered a paper at the GL convention. Larry Kalinowski's name pops up a few times, once in connection with an image he took of a Nova and Delphinus. And the March 1968 issue, which I'm still processing right now, has a book review with, appropriately on today's date. Um, the six, a uh, field book of the skies. But the reviewer, C.D. Marshall, managed to get the author's name spelled wrong. But I will review otherwise. <laughs> so that's the uh, report for the, the history subgroup. Excellent. Thank you, Dale. Dale has some very interesting stuff in the WASP, which is up, and I do recommend that you read it if you've not done so. I believe this concludes our subgroup reports. And we can move into observing. Gary M. Ross. Uh, oh, uh, could I deliver this? Please. Sorry. Yes, you may. I, I speak fluent Rossian. You do. Um, you do. Uh, lunar eclipse report and addenda. 4 to 5th July in stant. Sky was cloudless but turbid. Observation began circum 300 hours UT by naked eye. No thing visible of the penumbra. Moon was deep ivory color. At circa 350 UT, no penumbra visible in 7 by 35 binoculars. One, the globe was in deep libration, taking the far shore of Oceanus Procellarum to the limb. Across the disk, Mare Crisium approached circular. Plato, very dark. 418, dusky at limb, northern hemisphere. 430, north one third of diameter, quite darker than balance of disk, an effect approximating low contrast. 435, no effect visible to unaided eye. 443, at seven times dull pearl gray north, contrast to creamy south limb. Lack of contrast in features marked an area of Mare Frigoris in 5-inch Newtonian at approximately 100 times. Two, later ancillary observations. Endymion is an analogous echo for Plato as a dark feature across the Northern Hemisphere. I've actually noticed that as well, so there. Uh, Mare Humboldtianum is disappointing as a plane, just a large, dark, floored crater at this libration. At no time, during the eclipse was the effect visible to the naked eye. So all of the media hype for a partial penumbral eclipse, a phrase that sent Jeff McLeod into paroxysms of, uh, of irritation on my phone call with him this weekend, uh, was perhaps misdirected. 
It would have been nice if the media had been hyping people up about the wonderful comet that's going on right now. Anyway, the Jupiter addendum. Uh, oh, sorry. I sh oh, gosh. Jupiter reports supplemental. Seeing good at circa 100 times. Observations with and without green filter. Amazing satellite array. Ganymede at west elongation, while Callisto at her eastern elongation. Io and Europa at close side-by-side -side pair with the size difference between the moons obvious. The ice moon is smaller to the eye with essentially the same albedo as her volcano neighbor, hence a good opportunity to see the diameter difference. The great red spot was just west of central meridian and very red, whilst small. Intense feature in green filter, the same effect on the north equatorial belt with all its activity just below the telescope's resolution at that magnification. The south belt, by comparison, is wan and uninteresting despite carrying the red spot. From observing log, Shane CV Observatory, Observer Prime. Uh, so there were also some footnotes. Uh, so footnote one, binoculars were from the 1970s, not gyro-stabilized, not out of focus, not laser lined, not on carbon or aluminum fiber tripod, mounted on a wood and steel army surplus tripod from 1940s or 50s at a panhead of surplus shelving material, not purchased online, but gift from Martin Nathan Mill. And footnote two, the Newtonian made by Observer Prime, his father, John M. Ross, with mirror polished and figured by hand, Gerald Christopher Persia homemade wooden tripod and mount of two inch plumbing hardware counterweight of steel courtesy of american standard industrial division homemade spider fashioned at optic incorporated and aluminum tube no provision for electric hence no leds usb port hard drive monitor screen gps nor go to the finder telescope not useless red dot has an unknown origin and is mounted in rings salvaged from the barn also of unor unknown origin. The tube saddle is a converted pine box, also salvaged from the barn where it had languished since the 19, since 1986, fitted with hardware made by Mark John Christensen in Garage Machine Shop. This massive classic Newtonian boldly goes where no man has gone before, especially those with high-speed internet who dork on it constantly, or satellite TV when they could be observing with their space-age telescopes stillborn in garages or sheds. The old ways are the best. So if that was not Gary Ross, I don't know. What and that was the inimitable GM Ross's relayed by his official translator. Now that we have <laughs> five minutes left, does anybody else have an observing report? Yes, As I do. As you know, we had a lot of clear weather recently. And in doing so, it gave me a lot of, a lot of, uh, let's see, I need to share, right? Oh, gosh. Where's my uh, share? Here we go. Okay. So. Uh, we'll get started with uh, Abel 2151, a, the Hercules supercluster of galaxies. And I won't show you the plate solve in this, but it's in the it's in the newsletter. This uh, this object's in the newsletter along with the plate solve. But there's probably 50 galaxies that are visible in here. And we'll move on to other objects. This was came from the uh, Warren Club open house, uh, virtual open house. Uh, and this was Jonathan's uh, suggested uh, object for the night, uh, which was um, Delta Lyra. Notice the, the nice colors there. I also had uh, my 300 millimeter running uh, piggyback while I was working on various areas of the sky. And this just happens to be the area of the elephant's trunk, uh, wide angle, uh, 300 millimeter, fairly wide angle. Uh, this was the elephant's trunk through the 10-inch F8RC that same night. This is four hours of data. 
Uh, one of the other requests during the, <clears throat> the open house was M3 for Diane. And uh, I also ran a, a series of uh, tests for uh, some changes I made in the optical train. This would be the Lagoon Nebula. Uh, this is M14. Uh, this is uh, M16, the Eagle which also has the pillars of creation in the middle here. Uh, this is M17. The Trifid, M20. M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. M92 in Hercules. This is a test run on uh, NGC 6960, which is the uh, western veil with 52 Cygnus there, the bright one. This is a section of the eastern veil uh, as part of a composite that I was working on, or a uh, mosaic, rather. Uh, NGC 7331 with the Deerlick group, several galaxies in this field. This was the mosaic I, I did as a test run. Unfortunately, it was during a, a fairly bright moon last week. So I'll be working on this again. But that's nine panels, each of them 30 minutes. And that's my observing report for today. Fabulous. It looks like Doug can fill up the lost calendar all on his own. Let's uh, spend the second half of the year giving him uh, some competition, eh? Who else so, uh, report? I, I had a very strange observing session on Friday night. Uh, I was helping my friend Amit, who just got his first telescope, uh, try to use his telescope uh, over the phone uh, from many miles away. Uh, so he got a uh, the Celestron Sky. Oh, I keep forgetting the name of the thing. Um, but it, uh, so, yeah, the Celestron Star Sense Explorer. So it's a one thirty millimeter uh, five inch uh, Newtonian. Uh, but it has this it has this cool adapter that allows you to put your cell phone into this connector and. Uh, actually uh it uses your cell phone camera to plate solve on the sky so uh Amit has been trying to make that work and it's uh and so i i got to uh sort of talk him through looking at various things and i did some i took some live photos of the sky with my phone and circled the areas where he should point in the summer triangle and it was it was really cool even though and Diane and I left our all of our good telescopes up north, uh, so we don't. All we have is a sixty-six millimeter and a four and a half that desperately needs its optics uh, retooled. So, so yeah, that was perhaps not a great idea. We also have a much larger telescope that's in a trailer out front right now. But I don't think I'm going to set it up here. Yeah, I'll just wait for that Macomb observing report. All right, looks like. Uh... We have time for one more report before snack break. I got, I got, a, I got a report. Um, All right, Mark. Yeah, so I just want to encourage everybody um, to get out and start looking at Mars uh, right now. It's at the central meridian around 10 after 7 a.m., which is daylight. But um, if you've ever observed Mars during daylight, you know that it's actually a very good time to look at Mars because Mars is so bright. Um, we've had excellent seeing. I don't know if I can share my screen or not here. Um, but we've had we've had uh, excellent seeing here for the last week. We're into one of those uh, periods of time where the jet stream is pushed way north. Um, so for over a week, we've been in kind of quiet, still air. Um, the other morning, I was out. Uh, Mars is only subtending about 10 arc seconds, but it was so stable, I had clear views up around 400 power. Um, you could see plain as day, um, Sirtis Major, you could see um, Hayes and the Hellas Basin, 
You can see uh, haze on the following limb. You know, we're um, Martian morning, essentially. Um, very, and the southern polar cap is very pronounced, very large with a dark border, starting to get some albedo features within the um, south polar cap. So I just encourage everybody to get out because the uh, last opposition, we kind of got skunked with a massive dust storm and the conditions are excellent right now. Um, very good observing. So get out and take advantage of it if you've got one of those uh, computerized telescopes. Uh, what I suggest is go mark your uh, tripod legs, get, get kind of an orientation like I have an equatorial mount. Uh, I mark out the position of the leg so I can do a go-to in the morning and it's really easy to find Mars in the finder scope. Even in a six, uh, six by 35 finder scope, it's, it's pretty easy to see if we get a clear morning. Um, the other thing real quick is um, fish fly, mayflies, um, pretty interesting to watch them migrate across the full moon. Um, it's amazing how high they fly. I never realized how high they fly and how many of them there are. Um, I got a quick through the, uh, through the eyepiece screenshot. I don't know if you guys can see or not, but there's a little gaggle of them passing in front of the moon, but that's, that's all I had to share. That is the strangest UFO I've ever seen, Mark. And that is super cool, Mark. Yeah, it was pretty wild. All right. So, fabulous. And with the clear weather, I expect many more observing reports at our next meeting. In the meantime, it is 816. We have 14 minutes to take our informal snack break before we have our feature of the night. So, go grab a drink, grab a snack, and we'll reconvene at the bottom of the hour. I'd like to start right at the um, 8.30 mark because we have a tightly packed schedule for the debate. Yes, 8.30 mark. Yep. Thank you. Mark, did you run away? Hi, Mark. Yes. I was just wondering, um, am I able to see Mars with my eyes? I'm sorry? I said, I, is, it, is Mars visible with my uh, eyes? You can probably find it with a pair of binoculars. Naked eye, um, You, if you get up early enough, you can catch it um, more towards the southeast at probably like southeast? 5 o'clock in the morning. Naked eye, yeah. Um, okay, I'll try to look. Cool. Yeah, at, at 7 o'clock in the morning when it's light, um, you have a really good time. I don't. You can't do it naked eye. You need a pair of binoculars, you can find it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, early, earlier than that, you could see it. You know, you see you see Saturn and uh, Jupiter in the south, the southwest, right? And then you see Mars in the east, southeast. Yeah, they're all three of them are gorgeous in the morning. Yeah. Like you said, you got to get up way before seven. Okay. Yeah. okay, I'm normally up at five. I'll go look. Yeah, I'm going to look. Yeah, the stars are a little bit harder to see up here. I noticed than in Hawaii, where I'm from, it's super pitch black. Yeah, the nice definitely. thing about the morning is the the, the, the the space station, too. The space station goes by almost every morning, two, three, four in the morning. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. Mornings right now yeah. are just amazing. Yeah, so I right forgot. now... Oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I, I was yeah, just going to say, right now there's... Uh, so if when you look up in the sky at like five in the morning, it's uh, from the right to the left, it's Jupiter and then Saturn and then the moon and then Ve and then Mars and then Venus all in a line. So the, the mornings are just super gorgeous right now. Oh, cool. And the ISS. And the ISS. Well, Jonathan, have you got a head count for me? Uh, so the maximum I've seen on YouTube was 15. I think uh, there's I think people are taking a little break right now, but uh, so I would say the total, the most I've seen on today has been about 44, I think, was the total. Okay. Any thought about putting Gary Ross's comments in the WASP? Yeah, we probably will do that as well. They seem historical to me, <laughs> as well as hysterical. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I saw his, I just read on my other computer up there, I saw the uh, G. Cross's uh, comments, you know, SEA scope has nothing on mine. Um, I would love to debate Jim Ross in a uh, visual versus imaging debate 
simply because I've done and appreciated both. I've even gotten into binocular astronomy lately, and but I've I managed to see both sides of it in my journey, and I think that would be a fun debate because um, the uh, I had a revolution imager and I was showing pictures on screen of stuff. Um, when I first joined the lowbrow club and it was like, hey, did you get a view like this? And it's this view of M3. You see a bunch of stars. They're looking at it and going, OK, that's the type of view we normally get at a dark site with a lot of aperture. And I'm sitting there with a five inch telescope. So in the beginning, I was saying, you know, I can recreate all of your dark Please. sky views with this. Yeah, little My is going to work. And, 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 and an imager. Now, I've learned since that, well, it does wow. take more. Sorry. There's a lot yes, more to it. Yeah. Visually seeing things, there is a difference, especially when you observe the sun with H-alpha equipment and seeing prominences, it's a lot easier visually. Certain details and globular clusters are a lot easier visually. So there's pros and cons to both. So that, that would be a fun discussion with uh ross i think it would be a blast i think um, i i would be really interested in weighing in on that one too because i i mostly hold with gary uh in the just that you know there's a lot of public domain data out there if you just want to process data like you can process cassini data or you can process curiosity data where you can process Hubble data. And if only if all you want to do is process data, you know, there's not I, I mean to a certain extent, astrophotography, a lot of I think a lot of the appeal of astrophotography is, you know, conquering the equipment and getting a setup that can really do the sorts of things that you want to do. Um, but like the aesthetics you can bring in even if you don't have any equipment at all. Whereas with visual astronomy, that photon that was emitted from that supernova in M61 actually traveled through space and wound up on my retina. Like that's not something anyone else can do for you. Like only you can see that and only you can absorb that photon. Like when you look, when you look, uh, visually through a telescope at something you're really touching that thing and that's not true with astrophotography so much i mean your equipment is touching it that much is true and there's i mean not and you know there's tons of stuff that imaging is good for like uh the home spectroscopy yeah. uh stuff that's happening is crazy the photometry stuff that's happening where people you know amateurs are doing incredible work on discovering planets around other suns. Um, oh, that's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a quick, I have another quick story about how um, something as simple as the moon can touch the public. Um, I, out at Lake Erie Metro Park, I was trying to get a rising moon on the dead of the horizon over the water which is tough to do because if there's fog in the distance or something, then the moon looks distorted. Well, barely saw the moon coming up and I try and get a photo and I'm near a giant picnic. Everyone's there at the picnic, just having a good time playing music or whatever, things that you don't expect to see during COVID. And, um, and here I am with a big old lens. I have a 600 millimeter Sigma lens and I'm saying, I'm trying to get this picture. And I turn around and I point, that's the moon. The entire picnic stops and they're going for real, that's the moon. And um, in the vernacular, I pretty much say, you better grab your cell phone and come get you some of this moon. The entire, the entire picnic, one by one started picking up cell phones walking toward the coast so of course i walk away and give them their space and they're all looking at the rising moon they had never seen that um the moon look at like that over the uh over the uh, detroit river i was at lake erie metro park so it you know i'll 
say in terms of the homies, even the homies, um, their imagination is captured by the moon at that time. Something in space stopped them from what they were doing. Any to me, any public outreach, once they actually see something that amazes them, the you know, the blinders go off. You're you know, you, that's pretty much you've done outreach. You've shown some somebody something that they haven't seen before. And um, it doesn't matter where you're from. They're all probably from the city, east side maybe. And it stopped them in their tracks. Um, so just about it, I figure just about anybody can be interested. Even if it's the moon, there's still so much interest out there for it. So it's going to be very hard to tell folks, no, we're not doing it in person because of COVID-19, but we still encourage you to look up for yourself and actually go out and see it. Um, it was a it was a great experience, even if it was impromptu, just watching everybody just stop, try and take pictures of this rising moon over the water. It was, um, yeah, and it was a pretty beautiful sight too. I tried to make it a background screen, but it didn't work so well. Excellent um, analogy. Excellent description. Thanks. And what, I would the, say, like I've had, uh, you know, at at various events at museums or at parks, um, you know, you often you often have cantankerous uh, relatives of people who wanted to be there who didn't want to be there, uh, and they grudgingly look through the telescope, and when it's Saturn or the Moon or Jupiter, you know. They stop being cantankerous in in short order, and that you know is such a uh, it's just such a thing to see. Like that is something that I really desperately miss this year. Um, and even like uh, some friends of mine at work, you know, uh, just got telescopes, and uh, it's very frustrating to me to not be able to help them sort of get started. But you know, just to hear from them. I saw this and I saw that uh, is just it. It's it scratches the same itch, even though uh, I would still like to be, you know, reaching more people than just a few coworkers. Is Stellarium? I'm sorry. Is, is Stellarium still a good website to uh, track the heavens? Yeah, it's Stellarium is still like the kind of the default planetarium for a lot okay. of people um because uh, the other major computer planetarium software is uh people they it is pretty expensive and you really don't need the stuff that it does unless you are doing like astrophotography um which i'm not uh i these days i mostly use sky safari on my phone which is by the same people who make the sky uh and there's a free version of that and then and then there are paid versions of that from like four dollars to uh sixty dollars or something like that but uh but stellarium is still a great tool and a lot of people still use that as their primary planetarium yeah oh sure oh Oh, 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 sorry. <clears throat> I'm looking on, uh, I was looking on YouTube and I was trying to figure out why. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, I can't. Uh, here we go. Ready to start in half a minute? Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, See you start the program in half a minute. All right. Uh, I think we're just waiting on Dan to get back. Uh, so, so CLR45 said, oh, okay. Uh, the other night I connected lunar landings with my observations of the full moon. I was able to research and identify where Apollo 11 landed and made that connection. Uh, so that's super cool. Uh, After I read my response out there, it was basically I did the same for Apollo 15. It was awesome. all of them through. To me, their landing site is the easiest to spot. It's right between a couple mountain ridges. There's a real small plane 
kind of the uh, north north central part off of one of the mares. And that's excuse exactly me, eight thirty. We have a very tight schedule on the debate. If we could start, please. Okay. Can I ask? Um, I think uh, let's just show. I, I don't know. Maybe. How about? Yeah. How about, uh, could we ask? Could we ask? Uh, is everybody? Could everybody who's not uh, one of the debaters or the referee turn off the video, uh, so that the uh, we can sort of zoom in on the those our debaters this evening. Yeah, I think that's the best way of doing it. So before before I turn off my video, I would like to officially reconvene the meeting. It is eight thirty, and rather than handing things over to first vice president Dale Parton, I'm handing things over to John Blum, our moderator for the evening. Thanks, Diane. Ten years ago, we held our best attended WAS meeting ever. It was a debate about whether manned or unmanned space exploration is best. The issue has still not been settled. So tonight we will debate whether to send humans to Mars within the next 50 years, or whether to continue sending only robotic explorers to Mars. In favor of sending people to Mars, we have Jim Shedlowski and Dale Parton. Opposed to sending people to Mars, we have Ken Burton and Bob Tremblay. All four of our debaters are long-standing WASP members who have served years as officers in various board presenter positions. Two of them participated in the previous debate in 2010 and have not changed their position on this issue since then. I'm John Blum. I bought this referee shirt in a Halloween costume store for the debate in 2010, used it for a WASP debate about science fiction in 2011, and I'm delighted to get another chance to wear it tonight. All the participants have agreed to a schedule and time allotments for each part of tonight's debate. We begin with 15 minute opening statements from each side. So Jim and Dale, here comes your 15 minutes of fame. Go. Where is Dale? Yeah, is Dale here? Yeah, there's Dale. Yes. Jerry. Okay. Jerry Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our first virtual debate with a question. Should we send people to Mars by 2070? We say yes, absolutely, really by 2057, which will be my 100th birthday. Dale and, and would I- Would you like the slides up? I'm sorry? Would you like your slides up now? Yes. Slides. Okay. Well, what, are, what are we doing here? Am I on? Yes. You are on, and uh, Jonathan's working on your slides. Okay, good. Uh, Dale, I, I'd like to thank Dale, first of all, for producing these uh, PowerPoint slides that we'll use tonight. And uh, we would like to acknowledge that while there are major challenges to get people to Mars, such as spacecraft development, life support system development, medical hazards, living off the land technology and costs. We will address each of these issues. For the challenges met result in the opportunities and then progress. So you might ask, why should we send people to Mars? There are many reasons. Homo sapiens are curious problem solvers, explorers. Problems can be viewed as opportunities a can-do approach. It's who we are. It's what we do. Number two, mankind has always accepted challenges, the challenges of frontiers, such as Native American migration from Asia, Columbus, Magellan, Marco Polo, Edmund Hillary, John F. Kennedy, Lindbergh, Lewis and Clark, and on and on and on. Number three, our step in a long-term insurance policy for the potential survival of the human aid, race. Colonization will take a long time and it must be started. Number four, if we develop space-faring capabilities, we may have the opportunity of saving the Earth by deflecting an incoming asteroid or comet. 
Uh, excuse me, what are we on here, Dean? What's this slide? Thank you. There are technical spinoffs, medical, biological, agricultural, engineering, which would be a continuation of the 60s race to the moon. To us, faster computers, CCDs, and Tang. Number six, science and geology study on another planet may assist us in solving global warming properties. Having scientists in advanced labs on Mars will greatly accelerate this study. And maybe more important, the search for life on Mars, current or past. Could Mars be our birthplace? Surveys show that past flowing water have been on Mars for were on Mars for almost a billion years. It might be our best bet to find out if there is other life in the universe or if we're all alone, which is the philosophical question. Are we alone? The big question, is the Earth unique in the universe? And finally, it may give us the opportunity to unite mankind through a collaboration like the International Space Station or a competition to assure U.S. technical leadership in the international world. And with that, I'd like to now uh, I'll have now Dale will explain how we propose to meet these challenges and send humans to Mars. Dale. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> we heard uh, recently Dr. Alan Kaplan give us a talk on space medicine, uh, and he identified a bunch of really serious problems that you'll see listed here, <clears throat> to the point where I had to say, is going to Mars suicidal? Uh, the problems are so serious. So I'm going to go through these problems one at a time. Next slide, please. Uh, first, let's talk about explosions, collisions, and other accidents. Um, <clears throat> during the space shuttle program, NASA had a standard that no more than 3% of astronauts could die uh, over all the missions. And uh, with two shuttle flights that crashed, they actually achieved a 1.8% fatality rate per mission. Pretty high. <clears throat> The new NASA standard is one chance in 270, about 0.4%, so about a 10 times stricter standard loss of life permission to the ISS. They haven't published what the standard will be for going to Mars yet. They estimate that the SpaceX Crew Dragon meets this standard <clears throat> of going to the ISS with the dominant risk, interestingly, being collision with space debris in low Earth orbit. For comparison with these numbers, you can look at the commercial passenger airline industry, which has an extremely low crash rate. But this is a mature industry. In the early days of aviation, the saying was, any landing you could walk away from was a good landing. Um, <clears throat> There are a lot of things in uh, the U.S. Uh, workforce occupations that have high uh, accident rates and fatality rates, <clears throat> especially it's like 0.07% in per year in industries like logging, fishing, and aircraft pilots. Aircraft pilots, because most pilots are flying cargo planes or single engine airplanes, where the accident rate is sky high <clears throat> by comparison with commercial passenger airline flights. Even driving a car in this country has substantial risks. Uh, next slide, please. Jonathan, thank you. Uh, I'm going to skip this for lack of time. Next slide, please. Uh, another <clears throat> um, uh, 
concern that was raised by Dr. Kaplan was toxic materials inside a spacecraft, especially because the air keeps getting recirculated in a spacecraft. I think we've come a long way since the early days of space flight. <clears throat> and I only have to point to the International Space Station. They seem to have managed this issue of toxic materials. Um, I think a more serious issue for going to Mars is uh, the issue of toxic materials in Martian soil, uh, especially uh, the one that's the, the biggest concern right now is perchlorate uh, compounds. Uh, this is a chemical similar to bleach. Um, so this would require special precautions to not bring dust on a space suit into a Martian habitat. Uh, people are looking at ways to do that. Uh, I just learned that perchlorate compounds are one component of rocket fuel for the kind of fireworks we were all looking at a few nights ago. So if you were downwind from that kind of fireworks, you were breathing perchlorate materials. Next slide, please. Um, Another issue is weightlessness. Uh, being weightless on the International Space Station for months has very serious negative uh, health issues. <clears throat> the way to solve this is to use artificial gravity. Um, for example, uh, spending, sending two spacecraft to Mars together uh, tied together with a tether and spinning about an axis heading for Mars, as you see in the picture. And on the right, I show you some numbers uh, where you could get 1G or Earth gravity equivalent, or if you prefer, you can get 0.38G, 38% of Earth gravity to simulate Martian gravity. Uh, next slide. Uh, one concern about Martian gravity is we don't actually know if that's enough gravity, 38% of Earth gravity, to keep people healthy. Shame on NASA for not being proactive in investigating that uh, issue in low Earth orbit. Uh, but we don't really know yet. If that's not enough gravity, then we may need to have people living on Mars spend part of their day in a centrifuge. And there is a chemical that's recently been under study that seems to show initial promise of reducing the effects of low gravity. Uh, next slide, please. Another issue is radiation. I have two slides on this. The first will be issues about traveling to and from Mars. The second will be radiation on the surface of Mars. There are two sources of radiation. Solar wind, which is high energy particles from the sun, mostly protons, because the sun is mostly hydrogen. And then higher energy particles called cosmic rays. Either of them can cause cancer and other health issues if one is exposed to them too much. Uh, solar wind particles from the sun are at lower energy, roughly million electron volt kind of energies, and are easier to shield against. However, during a coronal mass ejection from the sun, their intensity becomes extremely high. They could be lethal within a few hours if you're not protected from them. Uh, but this can be avoided by uh, when a solar storm happens by having everyone crowd into a highly shielded storm shelter for a few hours. You only have to worry about uh, this radiation in that situation coming from one direction from the sun. So you only have to have shielding from that direction. So you can have some extra thick shielding uh, for that. So that's not a serious problem. Uh, cosmic rays are more of a problem. They come in at much higher energy, uh, giga electron volts or billion electron volts and up, and much more so they're much more penetrating. Uh, they come at low intensity, but they come from all directions all the time. Uh, shielding can give some protection from them, basically from the lower energy ones, maybe 30% of them. Uh, water and polyethylene 
are good absorbers of the this radiation better than lead in terms of the total mass you need uh, because hydrogen atoms are good at uh, stopping this kind of radiation uh, and NASA is in, in, inventing or developing a new material or a nitride nanotube stuffed with hydrogen atoms for shielding from cosmic rays you can even make cloth out of it next slide please Jonathan thank you on the surface of Mars one good thing is the cosmic ray radiation gets cut in half because the planet shields you from stuff coming from below you. Um, so habitats on the Martian surface will need to be give you protection from uh, solar wind and cosmic rays. NASA had a, a contest recently to for three D printed uh, shelters or uh, uh, to um, uh, that would use Martian regolith material for to construct these shelters. This is one example. Um, so you could do that to get shelter from radiation or uh, from satellite. You can see good sized holes in the Martian surface, like the one in the lower right. So you could, I mean, there are people highly interested in exploring those to see if you could um, build habitats underground. Uh, so with proper shielding, uh, radiation for a three year round trip can reduce to 50 rems or less. That would, by the way, get the cancer rate induced by that radiation below 1%. Next slide, please. Um, then there are these psychological issues uh, raised in Dr. Kaplan's presentation. Um, as an example, the SpaceX Starship is being uh, designed to hold many people, but you could cut it down to 20 to 40 uh, to reduce confinement issues, give people more space. Uh, this would give people more of a society than just a crew of three or four and make isolation more manageable. I'm gonna, to save time, let's go to the next slide. This is my last slide. Uh, so cost, could the money be better spent on something else like climate change, improving uh, standard of living for the poor? Waiting for these problems to be solved means waiting forever. And the cost of putting people on Mars looks like it's going from 200 billion down to more like 20 billion by letting private industry have a significant role in getting us there. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. Uh, now we have Ken and Bob with their response and their 15 minutes of pain. Ken and Bob, you can start. Okay, Can't hear you. Unmute, Ken. Can't hear you, Ken. You're muted. Not muted now. Okay. I, I, I want to thank um, uh, Dale and, uh, and Jim for uh, making our arguments for us. Uh, every topic that you point, pointed to, uh, we are going to use today as well, but uh, you actually were much more complete than us of talking us out of doing this trip. The first thing that I want to say is NASA, listen, what's going on? Uh, all right. NASA's mission to Mars will be the toughest undertaking in its, in its history. The launch from Earth will be a monumental challenge. The journey to Mars filled with danger. Being on the red planet will be a test unlike anything NASA has, forced be has faced before. It's wise to make a bullet list of why going to Mars is hard, and that's going to be a very long list. This bullet, these bullet points are going to be scary and that, in that a lot of these are very, very serious problems. Uh, we've talked about this uh, at length, Bob and I. We don't need all the wonderful slides. Thank you very much for supplying our slides for us tonight too, gentlemen. The first uh, area that we discuss is the travel. Uh, this is a two-year trip uh, there and back and being there. It takes 10 months to get there, maybe eight. It takes 
10 months to get back, maybe six or eight. And you got to be up for a while. Excitement. And excitement is getting there. We're not going to just travel around it and come back like Apollo uh, 8 uh, did. We're going to get there and we're going to land there. Um, Anything you want to say about the travel, uh, Bob? Go well, ahead. Well, yeah. Well, um, the, actually, I'd like to talk about the landing. Um, one of the problems with Mars is a landing on it. Um, it's got ju- its atmosphere is one one hundredth as thick as ours, and so it's got just enough atmosphere that you have to worry about it. But you can stop uh, probes. Uh, robotic probes using uh, uh, hypersonic parachutes. You can't do that with humans. Uh, It would turn them into jelly. So um, you have to use thrust to land them. And uh, that requires propellant. And um, if you are going to be getting the astronauts back from the surface, you've got to have a return ascent stage. You've got to land that too. And we'll be talking about all all, all those requirements uh, in a little while. So Ken, you want to kind of continue on with uh, space environment? We talked about uh, Dale pointed out the, the exposure mm-hmm. to space environment. The the the, the uh, problem with the space environment is number one, solar wind, as uh, Dale was nice to bring up. Uh, you have uh, CMEs, which are coronal mass ejections. Uh, we sent the humans to uh, the moon, and we got lucky because if that solar mass ejection had happened any time any of those trips were going on, the astronauts would have died uh, from a CME. We are not talking about going to the moon. We are talking about going to Mars. So the chances of a CME or a solar wind intensity is is many, 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 many times fold. Uh, you have the radiation that is involved in that that situation. The radiation is going to be continuous with them. When you shield the ship from radiation, you can use water as we talked about, but you gotta carry it with you. And that means that means the weight of the trip is going to be that. If you talk it requires several feet of water to shield from certain types of radiation. The other one that we talked about was meteors. All you got to do is get hit by a meteor just enough to move your ship off, of course. That's going to cause a great deal of problems because you're going to have to adjust your trip, and that takes more fuel, and that takes more to do. And if it gets hit hard enough, you're done. Uh, those, those, uh, those meteors are moving at, uh, at 60,000 miles per hour as much. And all you got to do is, is be able, you got to be able to see it, and you got to be able to avoid it. And we're talking about 20 months of avoiding it. Um, and of course, the cosmic rays, which were brought up. Bob, go. Okay. Um, well, what, what am I doing? Cosmic rays here? Cosmic, cosmic rays. rays. Cosmic rays. If you don't know what cosmic rays are, they are probably created in supernova explosions. They are well, like hydrogen protons or helium nuclei that are traveling damn near the speed of light. So they pack a lot of energy. And astronauts on the International Space Station have said that they have seen like little explosions in their eye and that's from second secondary particles being created when cosmic rays hit the, the, the vitreous fluid in your eyes, yuck. Uh, you're gonna be having these the entire way to Mars and they're coming in from all angles. And uh, I have yet to see a satisfactory radiation shielding method. We've got uh, water, which is heavy. You've got metal, which is heavy. New materials, I would, I, great. I can't wait to see some of the new materials. But right, as of right now, we don't have a satisfactory radiation shielding method. Okay, now we go on to the next uh, high point is the physical issues, such as weightlessness and muscle deterioration, which Alan brought up, uh, me- brain malfunction, which is, a, which is also a cause, and any medical emergency. But let's talk about muscle deterioration first. We know that we just go to to the uh, space station and we come back and they can hardly walk. We're now talking about being on a ship. No matter how much exercise you're going to do, you're going to be on that ship for 10 months. You're going to get on that place and there's not much you can do about the the muscle deterioration that's going to go on. If you have a large enough ship, maybe you can do some things in that regard. 
There's also the issue with brain malfunction, which we talked about, where the people can can have a situation where they will lose gaps in thought processes. We've already seen that occur, where what happens if there's an emergency? What do the astronauts do at that point in time to save their butts from 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 uh, being uh, trying to get back in their ship or whatever it is, or if two or three of them have it? And you have your medical emergency. If somebody gets sick on that, that thing, what are you going to do? Are you going to operate? What is going to happen here? You're not going back to the hospital. I wanted to point out one very, very big hurdle, and that had to do with... Uh, with the, uh, the human body and a spacecraft between the planets is going to be a dangerous uh, trip. When astronaut James Irwin stood on the moon, his heart beat irregularly. Back on the Earth, Irwin suffered heart attacks, and eventually, which eventually proved fatal. A 2016 study found that lo Apollo lunar astronauts are up to five times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than astronauts who never left the Earth's orbit. One cause could be the deep space radiation, and radiation, even on the ISS, could be damaging the heart muscles. The nervous system of astronauts, including brains of our astronauts headed to Mars, will face radiation created in the core of stars. Our sun throws out streams of deadly charged particles. Cosmic rays from outside the solar system created supernovas are energetic particles that race through the galaxy at close to the speed of light. Being exposed to too many of them presents a problem. In low doses, it's not a problem. They can, but they can penetrate the body and damage the DNA. Over the long term, even relatively low doses can cause damage to human bodies. Thus, the longer one stays in space, the greater the danger. Remember, our missions to the moon were in the order of a week or two. One mission to Mars is a minimum is going to take something like two to two and a half years. And cosmic bullets can cause mutations and even cancer. Research in 2019 suggests space radiation will cause memory loss in one to three astronauts on a mission to Mars. Therefore, it's not a problem for getting where you left your keys. It has to try to get back into an airlock. One does, does, does not want to forget emergency procedures. Obviously, we are going to have to really consider how to mitigate effects of the radiation and so on and so forth on that point. So there's your next issue. And now so, I'm going to turn it over to you to pay. pay so, uh, well, pay, uh, well, I'd like to cover uh, muscle deterioration just really quick here. Weightlessness. One of the things that we've discovered uh, with years of study is that weightlessness is not good on the, on the body. And one of the things that uh, Dale brought up was artificial gravity uh, using rotational gravity. Uh, in researching this, I found several different articles talking about uh, doing that kind of thing. Uh, even one of them disappeared in in the couple days off the NASA site from when I saw it. But um, so th there's a whole bunch of ideas. Nobody has any solid plans of doing that. So let's talk about payloads. When you, when you talk about putting stuff into, into space, you're talking about payload. And humans are pretty much the worst payload you can put into space. Um, they require an enormous amount of life support um, of the oxygen. The food and I and there's an interesting thing I found uh, for a three year mission to Mars for four crew, it will take approximately 24,000 pounds of food and you've got to thrust all that. That's more payload. Um, you've got to take all your water with you. Um, use that for radiation shielding. Yeah, but so you've got to take everything with you there. Um, food, water, oxygen and and what are you going to do about the gravity? <laughs> so, Ken? All right. Well, okay. So now we've talked about getting there and taking the payload, which is an enormous task to do. And uh, now we talk about the Mars environment, which we talked about. We've got the two things that we even mentioned, thank you very much, is the electrical charge and power loss, these dust storms. Why are you going to power all of your material? When you get there, you've got to carry all that power, whatever it is, but you've got situations called dust storms. And these dust storms have electrical power loss, electrical charges, which can give you power loss to your systems. Uh, they are this, the, uh, the dust is sticky. It sticks on the things. It has to be off there. Anything you breathe in with that is poisonous, deadly poisonous. So you can't do that. You have the perfect. Collates that we talked about. 
even a little bit of it. You can't use Mars to feed yourself because the percolites will be in the food and it will kill you. So you can't do the things that you want to do just on Earth because you have all these other things. For example, let's take Opportunity. Opportunity got there. It had solar panels, which they're going to probably have to use. Solar panels got dusty, and the power source went out. And it was there, and those dust storms are continuous, and they are horrid. You don't get the sunlight coming in, and you can destroy your nuclear power or whatever you want to do just by the electromagnetic problems that are produced from it. Um, anything else you want to add on that one, uh, Bob? Um, well, um, power, if you, if you can't have solar, the other option, it, well, the other two options are bicycles, which nobody is going to do, or nuclear. And nuclear has its own set of problems like availability, weight, more payload problems, and, uh, and safety. If yeah, well, on on the off chance a meteor, which we haven't talked about, meteor creams your uh, your power plant. Now you've got a radioactive crater. Yay! So uh, dust, poison, percolate. So what what else for power? Um, we haven't talked about uh, what's our time? under underground. John, what's our time on this right now? Where are we? How long we have? I can't hear you. You're muted. Two minutes left. Okay, go. Let's. We got to do this quick because it's the last. All right. So, uh, let's do the psychological. Okay. You got. You got confinement issues, which we talked about. Separation from family and privacy. These are problems with four people on there. The last thing we want to talk about is cost, and this is our last two minutes. We've discovered there is a, 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 a statistic that says that ninety five dollars at ninety five cents out of every dollar. And if it's wrong by 15 cents or whatever it is, is spent on keeping humans safe in space. And what we are talking about is the answer to this is robotics. What we are doing is we're getting better and better at robotics. And what we expect to do is we want us we want to send we want to send. Uh, uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, we are moving in that direction. We're getting better and better at it. Why would you risk human life to go there to, to explore as what Jim said, we are an exploring feature, exploring places like Mars and other places like that is not like exploring the earth. You can't take a fishing pole and throw it into the water and get yourself a fish. There's, not, there's nothing there to, that's going to you, it will help you and we might as well take that enormous amount of money and pour it into the robotics and get better and better and better at it and even get our individual intelligence where we can send this artificial intelligence to do everything that we want it to do. And that's what we think that the cost is. is that. And the last question is, where the hell are we going afterward? Are we going to Jupiter? Highly radiation. Are we going to go to the stars? No, we're not going to go. Send the robots and we'll be able to do just what we do for a lot less money, number one, and without the enormous amount of risk that's involved in this. I, uh, Thanks, Ken. Perfect timing as usual. Ken's always got his stock signed right. Uh, okay, next we have each side has uh, five minutes to respond to the other side's opening remarks. So first we have Jim and Dale, five minutes response, go. You're Jim, you're muted. muted. Jim, you're muted. Jim is muted. Jim is muted. Jim, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Thank okay, you. Bob. Oh, Bob. I'd just like to ask both of you guys, what what would you have done if uh, you were Columbus going uh, to go to the Queen to ask for money to go on an expedition that had all kinds of unknowns, many more unknowns than a trip to Mars. We know so much about Mars and there's so many expeditions already in the planning stages that have addressed every single issue that you guys have brought up, including what Dale brought up on his opening statements. Dale? Okay, I have uh, several points here. I think you guys failed to make your case. Your arguments were weak. I did not adequately respond to the things I put in my uh, presentation. Uh, I had to skip 
the, the page on Martian dust storms. Uh, NASA is developing 10 kilowatt nuclear power uh, so you could disperse them around a habitat. They wouldn't all be in one place to give you back up in the case of a dust storm. Also, they will be manufacturing methane and oxygen in situ so you could use a natural gas generator to generate power during a dust storm. That fixes that. Uh, weightlessness, I agree with you that nobody is talking about spinning their spacecraft right now, but I think they will because they need to. Otherwise, the weightlessness issue is a big problem, just as Dr. Kaplan indicated. You worry about meteors hitting a ship in transit to Mars. This has never happened with any spacecraft going to Mars. This is a uh, ultra low probability event. Um, it's true that if a, a coronal mass ejection had happened and gone in, in the direction of the Earth during the Apollo missions, it would have killed them. Uh, they were lucky. We're not counting on luck here. It is assumed that on a six to eight month trip to Mars, you have to assume a coronal mass ejection will happen and be prepared for it. It's easy to shield from it because they all, all the um, uh, solar wind comes for, in one direction from the sun. So you can design a thick shelter in that direction to get everybody gets behind it for a few hours until the storm is over. Um, uh, in terms of the problem that the, there's not much atmospheric pressure on Mars to help you slow down a spacecraft, uh, spacecraft has modeled that, and uh, they're intending to partly slow down using a Martian spacecraft and then use propulsive landing to get you the rest of the way down. Um, and uh, I would suggest that you read a book called The Case for Mars in which uh, Zubrin addresses in more detail than I have time to right here, um, the issues that you're raising. Absolutely. Uh, Jim, do you have comments to, to make? No, I just, uh, I just uh, uh, suggest you guys do some reading about facts rather than fiction. The travel times that you've talked about going to and from Mars are, are fantastic. And we'll see taking a Model T rocket, I guess. And Zubrin's book covers every single issue you've mentioned in great detail. He wrote it 25 years ago. We were ready to go then. We should be ready to go now. Uh, if we are planning on staying on Earth to, for the rest of humanity's lifetime, Ken, then that's what we should do, I guess, if, if that's uh, your, your view of humanity. That, that's yours, right? Okay. About 20 seconds left after you guys finish. Oh, yeah. Uh, just uh, you, you did mention that uh, uh, the uh, the dust storms would, the, you, you probably realize there are three major detailed plans for, for uh, going to Mars right now within the next 10 years. They each use different, different sources of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of energy and things like that. But they all use some enabling technologies that are very significant, and that is the manufacture of rocket fuel on Mars from Mars materials. Okay, so living, up so living, off the land, living off the land will make a travel to Mars a reality. Okay, thanks uh, to Jim and Dale. Now we have uh, Ken and Bob get five minutes to uh, respond to uh, the opening remarks. Go ahead, Bob. You're up. Go ahead. All right. Um, well, where do I start? Here? First of all, I don't think that I don't think that there's anything that uh, there's a whole lot of technologies that need to be developed before we can go to Mars, and I don't think there's anything that we can't do on the Moon that we can't do on the Mars Mars first. Um, I think we develop a lot of technologies and techniques that we would take with us. Um, when we went to the moon, we were in a race with another country. We are not in a race right now. There is no hurry to get to Mars, and uh, we, we, sh we should do it right. 
Um, you're talking about books. I'd suggest you guys read a book called Packing for Mars by Mary Roach. She goes into exhaustive detail on all of the testing that needed to be done for the Apollo era. And like I said, it's exhaustive. And she goes into this, this same kind of stuff is going to be need to dump, be done for Mars. Um, as, a bo as a boy, I always wanted to go into space, but with what we've learned about what space does to the human body, it's sad when your childhood dreams get destroyed by science. I, I don't want to go into space anymore. I would love to see the Earth from space. I wouldn't want to go into space right now. Ken? One of the things that you guys are doing is you're thinking inside the box. Okay, that's what you're doing. You've already criticized us, but that's what you're thinking. The point about it is, is technology is, is geometric, pretty much, in what we do with what we can do with robotics and the like. Uh, car crashes are not relevant. Plane crashes are not relevant. The difference between Columbus is physics. We have physics that prevent us from doing the things that we want to do when we go into space. The point is, is we're not going anywhere. You want to know something as far as the humans in space are concerned, we can take the money and we can put it into robotics and eventually we'll be able to move our earth out of orbit. If you talk about thousands of years of technology that are going to go in to when we are threatened for this earth to be destroyed by the sun and so on and so forth, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of millions of years. The point is that we don't belong in space. Humans don't belong in space and it costs too much to do it. And the biggest argument that we have against what you're saying, as far as Columbus and the, the curiosity and all that, we're not going anywhere. You want to go to Jupiter and get radiated? You want to go to a star? You're not going. Forget it. It's not going to happen. We can't do it physically. We can send robots for a lot less money than what we have with that. Um, additionally, um, you continually criticize that we weren't having, didn't have a very strong argument. The fact of the matter is, is you gave us all of our arguments with your, your, your part of the debate. The arguments are, we don't know how to handle percolates, collates, uh, chlorates rather. We don't know how to handle weight in a sip for a while. We still have bone mass loss. We are not talking about going across the ocean. We are talking about going to Mars and a 10 month trip there. With everything you got to take, you talked about using the the other the 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 the, the, uh, the regoliths and all that other on the thing. What are you going to do? What kind of machinery you're going to take there to do that? All right, it's not landing a 2,600 pound robot on Mars. It's landing thousands and thousands and thousands of plan of people on a pounds of people and their stuff on the Mars. It's not possible and it's not worth it. And we're talking about the basic issue is cost. We can put that money much better to use by, by using robotics and save the lives of the individuals that don't belong in space to begin with. Anything else you want to say, Bob? Yeah, our astronauts right now, uh, when they come back from the International Space Station after being up there for just a month or so, can't walk. After 10 months or after six months, let's do, do it conservative. On the, on, there's six months in weightlessness and you get to Mars, you're not going to be able to walk. And what how about coming there? back to Earth? Coming back to Earth. Yes, I'd like to go to the moon. I don't have a problem with going into orbit around the Earth. Mars is not a place to go, nor is any other place in space for humankind. Uh, yes. okay. you know, time. Okay. okay, thank you, uh, guys. So um, now we have uh, one minute for Jim and Dale to ask a question to Ken and Bob, and then they will have four minutes to answer the question. So, Jim and Dale, what's your question you'd like to ask? Uh, you guys say rather emphatically, people don't belong in space. Who are you to tell me? whether I can or can't go to space. Who are you? Do you advocate making going to space illegal or going to Mars illegal? Or are you simply expressing your own uh, misguided opinions? And, and I would add, um, I got students in my astronomy classes. I teach them these very risks we're talking about. No fooling, I teach them the risk. And then I take a poll 
How many of you, if you had, if you were able to go to Mars, would go? Twenty percent of them raised their hands. They have dreams about doing something great. Are you going to tell them they can't go legally? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, now, uh, Ken and Bob, you have four minutes to answer that question. Frankly, I'd like to send you both there. <laughs> yes, I have a select set of people I would like to send to Mars. <laughs> I didn't say you can't legally go. I didn't say that. I said they shouldn't go. There's a substantial difference between uh, of telling you you can't go and that you should go. The fact is that I'm saying that we shouldn't go, not that we can't. And I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm sure that man is going to travel into space because that's what he does. I believe that. I just don't think it's smart to do. There's too much we need to do on this planet oh. to take care of things that we need to do here, and we can do it. We can do that other with the robotics. Go ahead, Bob, you're in. Well, that well, okay. Columbus didn't have robots. We have robots, and when a robot dies, it's a sad thing, and some mission control specialists cry over it. If a human dies. They do, it's, it's much more serious. Now, we're not, today, we're not ready to go to Mars. We're probably not ready to go to Mars for 10 or 20 years, but we're gonna have, we have to develop a lot of technologies. And I keep seeing these technologies pushed off. And should we go to Mars? Eventually we might, right now, Probably not. We're, it's not safe. And if if we send a crew of four to Mars, we have to be prepared for some percentage of them to die. Now that happened on our current space program. Um, it, well, except for the reentry of the Columbia, but it, for for the the moon trip, we had a disaster, a successful disaster. We didn't have any deaths during the moon trip. For a Mars trip, I would place money on one of the astronauts, and that's going to have a severe psychological effect on this country if that happens. Um, when it comes to living on Mars, I think everybody is underestimating greatly about about the amount of food that's necessary. And when it comes to growing food, uh, hydroponics, it's, it's gonna require more than one dome. You're gonna have to have dozens of domes uh, to grow different uh, things and handling. You're not gonna be able to use the regolith unless we can get rid of the poor chlorates. Um, there's just a lot of things that need to be worked out. So. Let's start working them out, but it's it, we're not there yet. And if and honestly, if I could walk through a science fiction portal onto the surface of Mars right now, I don't think I'd want to do it. I, the other thing that I that I'm saying is that we have again. I think that we're underestimating, or at least you guys are, are underestimating what the what we need to do to get there i think that we are not capable of that for many many years i think that you mental can, doesn't I, cover it that doesn't cover me i just don't think that again my my thing has always been that i don't believe that men believe should be in in far space or or humankind should be there but again uh, you know we're, we're not that smart we've, we've we've proved that so maybe we will do it uh, trying to get someone back to the schedule. Uh, Ken and Bob, you have one minute to ask a question to Jim and Dale. Ken and Bob, you have a question you'd like to ask? I know you've got a good one. Go, go with it. What? I know you've got a good one. Ken, no, Bob, you want to ask no, a know. question to Ken and Dale? Yeah, go ahead. All right, okay. What are you, what is that beeping? What is that beeping? Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. The question that I have for you two is what do you believe why do you believe that we need to go to um to to mars why do we need to go to mars in any short period of time and i'm talking 50 years why do we have to go in the next 50 years to mars give me a reason okay jim and dale you have four minutes to answer that question well your question is 50 years your teammate said 10 to 20 years a moment ago. 
I think it will be 10 to 20 years. There'll be at least 10 before we're ready to go. Maybe, maybe 20. <clears throat> um, and in the meantime, we'll be sending robots there to learn things and we'll continue to after we send people there. Um, why not? It, it's true that we're learning a lot with robots, but it's painstakingly slow with uh, some with a one or two dozen scientists on the surface of Mars with well-equipped laboratories. We would just incredibly multiply the rate at which we were learning things. This is commonly acknowledged. Uh, we a stopgap is to try to bring samples back from the surface of Mars using robots but we can do way more, way faster, way better with scientists on the, on the scene. Jim, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I, I would like just to be very short because we can, we can and we should. We're human beings. We have been doing this forever in the 2000 to 10,000 years we've been on this planet. That's what people do. And I agree with you, Ken, that you're not smart enough to know. <laughs> you, that's what you said a minute ago. So. Well, so the human is having his statues torn down, so Ken's statue might get torn down in 500 years, too. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> we don't belong in space. That's my final thing. I, I think you, you guys are being just reactionary. To, just to respond to Bob. Uh, Bob Bob's thing saying there hasn't been any plans and that we shouldn't do it. I would like to show you a list. This is from uh, from Wikipedia. There's been 30 plans over the years, starting with Winner Ron Braun, for sending humans to uh, to Mars. And many of these later plans have got the kind of details you guys have been poo pooing all 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 night here. <laughs> After all the questions you just mentioned. I'm just saying that you, you Bob, mentioned, Bob mentioned uh, uh, the, the NASA competition for how you build structures on Mars, a three year study that was competed in a competition by many folks coming up with 3D printing of, of, uh, of structures on Mars using their regolith, for example. How are you going to get them there? All you have to get there is the robots. And and there and it's doable, uh, especially with a large spacecraft like SpaceX is talking about using. Uh, and all you have to take with you is some binder agent. You mostly would use Martian materials for the three D printing. And you send unmanned cargo ships up there, land them ahead of time. And you've got all the material you need when, when you get your people up there. Okay, and. Uh... You're in charge, Dr. Blum. Okay, uh, that's the end of that segment. The next segment is audience questions. So what we're going to do is, uh, if any person in the audience can be the first one to unmute themselves and ask a very short question, then each of the two sides will have four minutes to answer that same question. Uh, my, my question, I, I don't know if I was the first, but my question to the Contra side is why, uh, if if humans didn't Mars, would you prefer to see humans something else in space instead? Say that again. I didn't. I didn't so so so, supposing humans don't go to Mars next, is there a project that you would like to see crewed spaceflight do next? Okay, each side has up to four minutes to answer that question. Bob, you want to start? Well, I wish you wouldn't have said crude because I, I would have said, yeah, oh, crap. Um, unfortunately, I can't, see, I can't see the advantage with that. Um, again, we've discovered with research that you know, being in, humans being in space is, is not good. So... We the moon. Yes, we we should go back to the moon. We need to go back to the moon and develop technologies that we can take us with us back to Mars. That would that that's awesome. Um, but uh, past the moon, 
what have you got? Asteroids? Again, you've got the same issue of months in space. And uh, so, no, I, I, I personally can't see can't see it, it, Mars is it, and I don't think that's a good idea. So, Ken? My, my thought is, is that we have a lot of things we need to protect the Earth from, also from space. One of the things we need to do is we need to be better at at detecting and bringing down meteors that could possibly hit this earth. If a meteor hits this earth, we are done. And the point is, is I believe that the dollars should be spent in producing things that will take, take, take that into a protection situation for this particular earth. We also need to be able to uh, be able to uh, uh, protect ourselves better from coronal mass ejections. We have other things that need to be spent on rather than spending the fortune that it will take to take, take humans into space. I think with AIs, I think that's the answer to this particular question, and the AIs is this. What happens is if you can get a robot that can do anything a human can do, and I believe we're capable of getting to that point, without the risk, we can do it. If we have a human on Mars and something goes wrong and they need to talk to the Earth, they're talking about 30 minutes, 40 minutes to get any information back up to that situation, and that's a problem, whereas an AI would be programmed to be able to take care of all those things if you got to that level. What I'm saying is the money should be spent to make our robotics better. That's what we need to do and explore the space with that. We'll still get the same information and we're good to do and we don't put people at risk. Uh, Jim and Dale, would you like to make any answers to uh, Jonathan's question? Yes, yes. Um, I can think of a number of things I'd like to do in addition to going to Mars. <laughs> um, one of them would be uh, build a gigantic radio telescope or more than one and put it on the far side of the moon where there's no radio interference from all the stuff being broadcast on Earth. The gravity on the moon is small. Um, Absolutely. So it's easy to build a gigantic structure there. Not only would you be away from radio interference here on Earth, but uh, some of the interesting wavelength ranges are reflected back down to Earth or absorbed by the ionosphere. So you'd open up new ranges of the radio wave spectrum to study if you did that. That's one. Secondly, um, I think one of the benefits uh, that would go with building spacecraft big enough to go to Mars is you would be building the same kind of spacecraft you would need to send crewed missions out to uh, an asteroid to help deflect it if it was coming too close to the Earth. So that's a second thing you would uh, gain by greatly expanding our spacefaring capabilities. Thirdly, if you want to know things we could do with crewed missions other than go to Mars, let's say it, what Jeff Bezos puts emphasis on, mining uh, asteroids that are rich in precious metals. It's another thing you could do. Jim, you want to add anything? Take your mood off. You're muted again. He's muted. He's muted. Jim, you're muted. The, the largest question we have in science and in philosophy and in humankind today is, are we alone in the universe? Our best chance of answering that question in the, in the next hundred years is going to Mars. How? If there's no life on Mars, if there's no evidence of previous life on Mars, on a planet that was at one time for an extended period co com compatible with developing life, then the evidence is, is pretty conclusive that there may not be life on any of these other planets that we found in the Goldilocks zones around many uh, of the stars in the, in the Milky Way. Uh, if I can add to that, I don't think that would be conclusive evidence, but that would be a negative. And we would be off to Enceladus and um, Europa and Callisto to look for life there. I'm sure we will do that too. Right. Those are more difficult and dangerous missions than going to Mars by far. So I think Mars is the place to go right now to look for life. 
And I think we'll be heading there within 10 to 20 years. And I say that robotics will do the same thing. No way. Uh, robotics might succeed. I hope they do, but I'm not counting on them to because I think people are much more clever and adaptable uh, at collecting samples in difficult places. They'll be uh, exploring caves where it's difficult for robots to, to go. Uh, all kind of places underground is the place to find life on Mars. I really want to audience member who would like to be the next person to unmute themselves and ask a very short question and both sides will each side will have up to four minutes to answer the audience question. My okay. question is, if, um, uh -oh. yeah, I'll let you go. Okay, my question is, if another superpower broadcasts their plans, definite plans for going to Mars, do you think that is somehow going to galvanize the United States to up their timing and try and get there first? Okay, Ken, you want to go first for answering that? I'll take that. Um, I, I think that that's uh, that's that's an ego issue with, with the uh, with the United States uh, now question, and there would be no question that the United States would push forward to do to show their superiority in the world as far as their scientific things. As far as I think it's a smart thing to go do, I do not. I do not believe it. I believe that we need to uh, again steady our our powers on what we can do with the with the electronic robotic situation rather Thank than sending human. Uh, uh, Jim, and Dale, uh, Jim and Dale, do you want to answer that same question? You said four minutes. So, but, oh, go ahead. I thought you were done. Go ahead. Yes, you have, you have, sure. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Uh, I think the, uh, I think the, the, uh, the reality of it is already taking place and it's not just nations that are going to provide that competition. It's the free enterprise system and various companies that are already doing it. Bob? Well, we've already got a lot. We've already got multiple nations landing robots on Mars. Um, I have not seen any other nations even contemplate sending anyone to Mars. And I have a feeling there's a reason for that. Um, but when, I, when I'm sitting here thinking about sending humans to Mars, the whole thing, you need a human intelligence on Mars. You don't need a human body on Mars. And this is why I'm agreeing with Ken. If we can get AI to the point of being more human-like, how would that not suffice on Mars? If, if you could... Getting into the realm of science fiction here, if you could upload a human brain into an AI and send that to Mars, would that be adequate? Or do you have to have a human body there? What do you need on Mars? I think I think you need the intelligence, and we get that's back to AI. Um, now, if 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 another country wants to send humans to Mars, let them <laughs> go for it. Um, I want to see their plans. I, uh, I I don't think it's a good idea either. Uh, Ken, you look like you're talking, but you're muted, Ken. Not that. Uh, I'm you're just muted. I'm just saying that uh, what Bob just said. I think that we can technologically get to the point where we don't have to risk the do what we need to do, and I think that we will get all the information that we get. I think we will get all the things we need and also the help of, of, of learning about finding out if there's life on Mars and so on and so forth. I think that life is endemic in the universe. I think it's everywhere. Um, that's my thought process. I believe the chemical- Intelligent life or just life? I think intelligent life because of the size of it. I think that, that life is endemic. And I think that intelligent life is probably endemic also considering the vast size of the planets we have. I believe that. I, 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 about contacting them, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Have you ever taken a look at the area of the of the, the visible area of the Milky Way of stars that we can see 
uh, how big it is. If you take the, a big circle of the Milky Way, you got this much that you can see. And we're not going anywhere beyond that. We're just not going there. And if life is there, it hasn't found us. I don't think there's ever been, unless you can break the laws of physics. If you break the laws of physics, everything's out the window anyway. But I don't believe that we're capable of doing that. And well, that's, that's what Scotty always said to Captain Kirk. I can't break the laws of physics, but I can't quite do it in that Scottish accent, accent that he had. Just to say one thing real quickly that, that happened at, at the GLIAC. When the guy came up to me and says, I believe there's been UFOs and there's been people here and I want to argue with you. And I said, do you believe that the laws of, 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 of physics can be broken? And he said, yes. And I said, the argument is now over. I said, because that puts, throws everything out there. So that's the point. Okay. Um, Diane, I think you had a question that you didn't get to ask uh, a moment ago. Do you want to ask a question of both sides? Yes, yeah. I'd like to ask a question of both sides of it seems like this debate is being framed in terms of a civilian effort akin to the moonshot, akin to the current uh, space program here in the States. If it were instead a military operation in line with test piloting, in which the risk is definite and the risk is known uh, as part of the job rather than being unacceptable in a civilian program, how do you feel things would proceed differently? Militarily, absolutely, that's what the countries do. That's what they do, they, they're, they're, their expenses are that. That's all, we know that. I agree with you. Yeah, let's see, you have, a mil you have this military, you're going to be sending more people up into space for longer periods of time and you're going to start seeing all these effects we're talking about and somebody's going to die i had uh, i believe bob you mentioned a minute ago that you said if somebody else wants to do it some other country wants to do it let them go ahead does that mean you're abdicating uh, the leadership of this country in technology i don't know how that compares i don't know how that compares either uh we, we've already proven leadership in, in, well, in various forms of technology. We are not the leaders in all forms of technology. That's but, true, and um, we, we will not be if we, if we allow things like this to happen. And but our, our, my partner, uh, Dale, mentioned, uh, answered your question to a certain extent, Diane, uh, in our opening statements, when he mentioned the risk factors involved with a number of other activities. Uh, if I can comment, sure, military people are, understand that they are going to be put into harm's way in certain circumstances. Civilians do too. Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. He was a civilian and others had died uh, trying. Civilians are sort of capable of understanding risk too. The difference with them is they're not being ordered to go. They're saying, we want to go. We, I, like I said, I have taught in my astronomy classes these very things we're talking about. I haven't missed one of them. I taught those risks to my classes. Uh, and then I asked for a show of hands, how many would go if, if, if it didn't cost you something to go? 20% of the class raises their hand. They want to go. They understand the risk. All right, this is the difference between your argument and my argument right here. I do not believe that, that, I believe the intellectual is more important than the emotional. And I understand the emotional response of individuals of wanting to do this, like Jim. I believe the emotional thing says, yes, let's do it. But I am saying that it is not worth it emotionally to risk the lives when you can do it with science. And I want to do it with intellect. And intellect says you send you send robots or you send science into space to do the job, and you can control it from here. It's not like you're not you're just sending it out there for 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 a party. Emotionally, if somebody wants to go there, hey, go. And if you want to do it emotionally, I can't stop that. I don't say. Remember, we talked. You said to me, you should make laws. I'm not saying laws. I'm saying if you want to go, go. I just don't think it's smart. I think it's un it's emotionally unstabilizing to do that. That's all. Okay. Who are you 
to say my students are only responding emotionally. Why do because you think they that? They are, they are emotional. They want to go to space. I understand that. I was a kid, when I was a kid, I wanted to do a lot of things that, we became, that, that there was no possible that I'd ever do. I know that. That's that's human nature. Jim is actually right on that. Right. That's nature. It's but human I, nature. It's a smart thing when you get to physics. Well, I happen to have a student online right now, and in fact, 20% of my grandchildren want to go to space. <laughs> I have five grandchildren, and I'm the one who here. wants to go just posted an interesting thing on the chat. Uh, Becca, do you want to read that out loud, what you just posted, or do you want me to read it? Sure. Well, is my audio working? I'm having some audio trouble. So can people hear yes. me right now? Yes, we hear you, Becca. Okay, okay. Um, so in the chat, I said that future space expo exploration relies heavily on public support and funding, and nothing excites people more than human space exploration. Human space exploration is like, extremely inspiring and connects the whole world unlike any other thing. So if humans start pushing the boundaries of spaceflight, would interest in space ultimately dwindle? I know we were saying we could put all the money that we would have put in human spaceflight into creating technologies, but if we're not putting humans in space, would we even get that far? Yeah, right. This is doing a fantastic job on public relations lately. Every one of their missions has a Twitter feed and some have a Facebook feed, but they, they're doing updates constantly. I follow every one of the NASA missions I'm interested in on Twitter and I get up to date information. So for me, it's like, well, what what's new today? I'm constantly being updated and I'm, I'm finding that, you know, fascinating. And Watching the NASA mission control specialist freak out when Curiosity landed, uh, that was pretty exciting. And I, I really enjoyed that. And I wish I could have been there. I actually know somebody in that room, so I really wish I could have been there. No, but yeah. It's emotional. We understand that. You're right. Humans are emotional and they want to do it. I just think it's not the right way to go. In in two weeks, Becca, in two weeks, NASA will be launching Perseverance. One of the prime the prime uh, missions of Perseverance is to study the ability to make fuel, rocket fuel, on Mars, and other uh, other important technical things that we've been discussing today about manned travel to Mars. If we if we keep, if we uh, leave our future in uh, the I, with the idea of learning more and more about robotics rather than sending humans, uh, I think uh, then then Ken and, and Bob have a point. But the uh, as Ken mentioned a moment ago, the nature of human existence is to ask the questions and answer the questions and the challenge of the new frontier. The new frontier, in this case, is Mars. Um, the old frontier. I'm live. Uh, I would agree, except I would talk about human flights, not man flights. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, am, I am not against sending humans to Mars if we can solve all of these problems. I mean, Columbus, didn't swim to America. He had technology. He battled storms. He battled very, very. He battled a lot of unknowns at the time. He let the people who knew what they were doing do his work for him. And he all the credit. The thing is, we can't deal with unknowns. We have to know what we're dealing with every step of the way. Again, financially, it's what I'm saying in the time. That's my point. Calculated risk. Yeah, well, again, <laughs> I'm saying why risk it when you don't have to? Magellan why when you don't have to. Magellan died, right? Oh, certainly did. Yes, he did. He did, pro he did prove the world was wrong. No, he didn't. He only proved that it was half round. He was dead before he got half all the way around. Oh. <laughs> So it was John F. Kennedy that went to the moon, huh, Ken? Well, again, like I said, I'm 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 in the technological situation 
intellectually and the emotion is important to human beings, but I think we can do better. But you, you proved I just a moment ago, uh, Ken, I wrote down a note when you were saying it, that you stuck your head in the sand, and I think that's where it'll belong. No, I'm not. <laughs> Well, on that uh, personal note, um, I think it is time for our closing statement. So each side is going to have six minutes to make a closing statement. And we're going to start with the uh, yes side with Jim and Dale and your six minute closing statement. Okay, uh, Jim and I have divided the time. I'm going to start. Um, there are challenges and risks. A lot of this conversation has been about risk to people. There are challenges and risks to sending people to Mars, just as there were in sending people to the moon. That was super risky. I, re I recall hearing one of the Apollo astronauts saying they were lucky that no one died on one of those missions. Were we wrong to send them? I don't think so. It was quite dangerous when people crossed an ocean for the first time by ship and then later by aircraft, some didn't make it, but eventually there was success. Now, many of us have flown across the ocean. We will soon be able to send people by Mar to Mars, probably within 10 years at most 20. From a technical perspective, we could have done it decades ago. The game changer has been letting private industry take much of the lead role. This is reducing the cost to the point where it's financially feasible to do it. It also means the goal is more stable with regard to changes in Washington. So yes, the enterprise of sending people to Mars does involve risk. Some people will die in the process, but most will survive. We all take risks. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, some occupations here in the United States are pretty high risk. Military people go into combat where the chance of death is high. Why do we take these risks? Well, obviously some people think it's worth it based on their needs, values, and dreams. Not everyone has the same risk tolerance or the same values and dreams. Some people highly value human exploration of the solar system. They, I should say we, support sending people to Mars. And many of us would go if given the chance. There's so much to learn there. And for many things, having scientists on the ground with advanced laboratory equipment is far more efficient than doing research with robots. I want to get them there during my lifetime so I start to learn what they can learn before I'm out of the picture. First of all, first and foremost, was there ever life on Mars? And also, what is the geological history of Mars? What is the story of Mars? Somewhere beyond that, can humans survive on Mars long term? Uh, as I mentioned, I've taught the risks of going to Mars to my astronomy students. A lot of them would like to go. The rest want to watch it on a computer. That's fine. Nobody's forcing anyone to go. I hope this debate has been informative. Frankly, I haven't enjoyed it that much because I'm forced to say things so fast that I don't get the chance to always think them through clearly. But I hope it's been informative. But make no mistake. Regardless of who, which side wins, quote unquote, this debate, we are going to Mars. And we're going relatively soon. And people in other countries like China will be going soon too. Jim? You're muted. Oops. Am I unmuted? Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks, Dale. I'd like to quote from a book, The Case for Mars, by Robert Zubrin, that uh, if you haven't read, you should, especially our opponents. From the preface of his book, quote, 
These are real, the case for going to Mars. These are real and vital reasons why we should venture to Mars. It is the key to unlocking the secret of life in the universe. It is a challenge to adventure that will inspire millions of young people to enter science and engineering and whose acceptance will reaffirm the nature of our society as a nation of pioneers. It is the door to an open future, a new frontier on a new world, a planet that can be settled the beginning of humanity's career as a spacefaring species with no limits to its resources or aspirations as it continues to push outward into the infinite universe beyond. For the science, for the challenge, for the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, closing for your closing statement. Now we have uh, six minutes for Ken and Bob to give their closing statement. All right. Um, Mars is not Earth. Mars is a cold, forbidding desert. No atmosphere, no uh, magnetic field to protect from radiation. It gets smacked by by asteroids. Uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has uh, logged like 300 new impacts since it's been watching Mars. Uh, it is it is not a friendly place. So going there, why? It, it yeah, it's a new planet, but the risks are terrible, and. We, we are exploring Mars right now. I remember when I was a teenager, the images from Viking were coming in and I was late for work because I was so excited about the images coming in. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My boss couldn't understand why I was excited. He's an idiot, but anyway. So we have a lot of scientists and engineers who I, 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 who, they, they have to have a sense of exploration and they are dreaming of going to another planet and they're taking care of these robots. They're their family. But, you know, these we are exploring Mars and um, it's in a way which is not putting humans at risk at all or very, very, very little. And we are learning in a lot of very important things. And like I said, I, I had a childhood dream of going into space, but with everything we've learned on the terrible effects on the human body, until we have solved these problems, I don't think we have any business sending humans to Mars. Because right now, if we send if we send humans to Mars right now in zero G, they won't be able to walk there. Plain and simple. So, and um, if if they come back after another six or eight months. They won't be able to walk here and they'll probably be in the hospital for a long time. So I, I think we, I, I want to explore the solar system. The thing is, humans are the worst payload you can send into space. They require so much support compared to our, our robots and our robots are getting much, much better. So I, I am all for sending robots and I would like to see them sent out to the gas, the uh, the ice giants, and I would like to see a Pluto orbiter, and I would like to see 12 things sent out into the heliosphere, and all of the money that would be spent on supporting humans could be spent on those missions. Ken? Okay, the moon is different. Financially feasible is what you said, Dale. Financially feasible is financially feasible with extra money to do what we need to do with humans. About the military risk, to answer that, that's force That's force determined. In other words, if somebody attacks you, you build yourself up to take care of that. So that's not a relevant point. You can learn with robots in the fraction of the cost that it takes to send humans to do it. Life on Mars, robots can learn about life on Mars if you get them more sophisticated at fraction of the cost. Human survival, human survival is the key. We can't survive in space. Use the same finances to pour it into the, into the technologies of robots because as it said 
if this is a true fact that 95 out of $100 is spent, 95 cents out of $1 is spent on keeping humans safe and pace, you have 20 times for the same amount of expenditure to pour into the robotics and in artificial in intelligence, you can build 20 times what you can do and get very sophisticated. And Bob hit it right on the nose. The point is that if we do it without humans, now we are going to save a lot of money, number one, but be able to pour that money into doing the same thing without the risk of life. And that's my point. The point is that the life is valuable and space is not where we belong. And um, again, there you go. I'm good. With an extra money. <laughs> Okay, if you guys are uh, set with your closing remarks, then uh, we have the uh, highlight of the evening as Jim uh, finishes us off with his uh, song, and we always look forward to that. Uh, Jim, unmute, unmute, Jim. We got to hear your song. He keeps muting himself. There he goes. Going to Mars. There is a place where we can go to see. Jim. Hey, Terry came here to hear Jim's song. Last slide. 
Uh, Diane, did you have any uh, closing uh, statements you want to make to end the meeting? Oh, okay. thank you all for a very lively debate. I, uh, fun as debates are, I am excited to uh, dive into panel discussions where we can get even more in on three or four or even five sides of an issue. Because as fun as a debate is, there's some of us who kind of agree with side and the other side and synthesize it to feel a third viewpoint. So very cool. Thank you all for joining. And uh, sorry that we can't have an afterglow at the red table. Good night, everybody. See you the third Thursday. Congratulations. Very well put. Well, and we do a great time ending at exactly in the right minute at 10 p.m. sharp. Listen, that's And Bob, us bumping elbows. That, that, uh, that's what happens when John runs a meeting. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I wanted... I wanted to say uh, I, I feel like I wasted my question because I thought of a much better one much later. But uh, you know, I think I think everyone can agree. Okay, there is who is feeding back? Somebody is feeding directly into the microphone. Jerry, Jerry Voorhees. No, there's some other ones too. Dunifer, feeding back. That's it, Dunifer. All right. Does this sound better now? Okay. okay. I mean, I'm. Uh, so, so you know, I think we can all agree that in the you know human exploration of the world, a lot of really terrible things happen from the Polynesian slaughter of the indigenous people of New Zealand to the fact that you know, something like 80% of the population of North America was killed by European settlers, either directly or in much larger numbers by disease. Um, and things like the Galapagos, you know, whole islands of the Galapagos were burned. Um, the, the drive for exploration resulted in the incredible emptying of the seas of whales. Like terrible things have happened in every regard from the rush to, you know, from the rush of European colonial powers to grab land um, and, and other, you know, other empires as well. So, like, why, why should we rush when it comes to expanding to other planets as well? Exactly. You're absolutely right, Jonathan. What do you mean, rush? Well, I mean, we still haven't figured out how to live here, you right. know? Right. So, <laughs> Like, uh, I mean, like we, we still are in the middle of a mass extinction going on here. And if we can't keep the life that sustains us alive on this planet, are we going to sustain ourselves on a planet without any, you know, life more likely than maybe small multicellular or single cell? Oh, contraire. I think we've done a fine job of sustaining life. We've got more humans on the planet than ever before, right? <laughs> well, yes, human human life, yes. But in terms of species, you know, we've lost uh, we've lost something like forty yes. percent of the species since civilization began. Yes. Uh, I mean, we're we're well into a geological era defined by human, you know, human operations, the Holocene. Um, See, I, so, so, and eventually, you know, it's look, possible it'll it's possible it'll keep on going forever without you know humans extincting ourselves by destroying the food chain. But it's equally possible that it won't. Uh, you know, it's one of those uncontrolled experiments that are hard to avoid when it comes to you know, you know, uh, certainly in the history of the you know of geology. We've seen lots of mass extinctions before. We've seen lots of the top animals on the planet die out before. Um, and But this would be the first time that they did it to themselves, I think. Uh, I have another attack that I, 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 I didn't get to ask a question. But, you know, NASA, before we went to the moon, took many, many, many small steps and then put a man on the moon. 
And now Elon Musk wants to put a man on Mars, and that's obviously for emotional reasons. It's a big deal. It's an intellectual uh, jump. But it's an, the ego next, boost. it's an ego boost. But the big thing that would seem to, to, to before we do that, we've got to do more stuff on the moon. Before we're going to put a colony or, or even a small group of people on uh, on Mars making uh, all kinds of products and having machinery and all kinds of stuff going on there to make oxygen and water and metal and whatever. We got to do that on the moon because there at least it's a lot simpler. And closer. And I have one more, I have just one more thing I want to say too. Uh, in, in the hospital laboratory, we always had to have backup equipment. You don't have one hemoglobin analyzer. You don't have one uh, uh, sort of machine to do cultures and stuff. You have to have backups because things break down. So when you're talking about putting equipment and machinery on Mars, you're talking about at least double and sometimes triple the stuff that you need for the important critical equipment. So you're the massive stuff that you have to put there is a lot bigger. Alan, you, you said that we took such small steps to get to the moon. We went to the moon in nine years. It's been 50 years since we went to the moon. The technologies are almost identical. And, well, and the, the other the point technologies is, are not that identical. I'm sorry. I think we have to do it on the moon to prove it's, uh, 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 that we can do it safely and properly. If you can't do it on the moon, you shouldn't go all the way to Mars. The moon has not hardly any resources, as Mars has a, a world of resources. We don't know that. And has plenty, uh, the moon has plenty of hydrogen free. I don't think that's correct, Jim. Well, it, it, again, read some of this literature we were talking about tonight. There, there, is, there are raw materials to make plastic, to make wood, to make fuel, to make oxygen on Mars right now. And it's been proven, and there have been demonstration projects about doing some of it. We got to get it there. No, it's there. No. You live, you live off the land. So if it's you can't live off the land on Mars, mine it. <laughs> you have to send the equipment the there to mine it. It's a matter of scale. It's a matter of scale. Robots have to go first. Then, then people. Exactly. Robots will go first. They will manufacture rocket fuel before we even send them there. There will be a fully fueled return vehicle on Mars before the men get there. I'll be happy if I see research into artificial gravity. I'll be so made in fact. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, I absolutely agree with what your statement was. I will tell you something that I do. That, that some people think I'm crazy, even my wife. When I see a spider in the house, I try and catch it and let it outside. The point that I, I have been trying to make of this whole thing is I believe that life is very, very, very important. And Jonathan hit it right on the nose. We're killing off the, the, the species on the earth. We're killing off. We do not need to go to some place out there without taking care of what we got to do here. And like what I'm saying is when you talk about the cost, and I hate to go back to that, if it costs a way, way less to send the robotic situations or artificial intelligence, we need to do that way earlier than we need to send humans there. And I'm talking in the neighborhood of 100 years or more that we need to do things. We can do it in space, but use the dollars more sensibly. That's what my thought is. We need to take care of the Earth. We need to go take a look at ours. I agree with you. We're good. I love that. That's fine. But the point is that we have too much to do. And we have this uh, limited resources to do. And that's what I'm saying. Use your resources properly and smartly prior to doing something of putting humans at risk. That's all. So we had to uh, skip this slide, but uh, the, the pro side did address the possibility of contaminating whatever that's Martian uh, biome yeah. there is uh, with Earth life. Um, I mean, I, I kind of, I'm I'm not super convinced by the argument that it'll spread downward because, so for instance, uh, some of you may be aware that uh, North America did not have any earthworms until 450 years ago. 
and now there is not an inch of soil in North America that doesn't have an earthworm in it. So, so yeah, I mean, that was only 450 years. So uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on downward spread uh, staying, staying local. Um, but the idea was not that it would stay local forever. Yeah, it, was, it would stay local plenty long enough for us to explore whether there might be uh, microorgan microorganisms on Mars that were indigenous to Mars. You yeah, might as well, well show the you, others. You might as should, well show the other slide too, Jonathan. Should we send humans to Mars before we're sure there's not indigenous life? That's a good point. Ironically, you know, people, it would be much easier to discover it with people. I mean, there's just no, uh, there's no denying that having people who can make decisions and move fast would get things done much faster than any robot will. Is speed a right concern? Now, you are right. Now, that's right. But not in, not in 20 years of technology, not necessarily. Well, that's keep in mind, all the robots that are on Mars are literally 20 year old. You know, the newest computer on Mars is 25 years old at this point. I'm not so. arguing that point. I'm saying that we that we can put the money into the technology is what you're exactly saying. Into technology, into, instead of keeping you humans in safe, you're going to be able to develop more robots that are going to be better at it in a shorter period of time because the dollars are going to do the technology things you want us to do. I agree with you. You're going to be you're going to be doing both. Well, I don't think you can do that. That's the problem. And, and in fact, now wait a minute. Just, didn't, didn't Elon Musk already send a Tesla to Mars? Did we no, he sent a Tesla wherever the heck. We can, it's, it's on the way. It's it's on the way. He sent a Tesla to the asteroid belt, really. Yeah, it's going to end up in the Let asteroid me, belt. Yeah, Elon Musk. You, you go out there and do photography tonight, Bach, you're going to get to see a whole bunch of Elon Musk of, of, of uh, spacecraft. Well, it's Douglas. not only tonight, but. We've already I had have... a, we've already had a grave prediction that uh, the uh, SpaceX spaceship towards Mars will crash with Starlink satellites. Yeah. In the fiery conclusion <laughs> that doom. Uh, listen, be ironic. You say you say prediction of doom. Some of us say poetic justice, but uh... <laughs> oh, there is that loss I, of life. I, I mean, unless they had a. Ken, yeah. this is Doug. Um, there's a there's a process and the, there's a technology process in my stacking software that allows me to take satellites out automatically. Good. It's just a lot of frames, but but once they're once they're everywhere, you know, even I, I mean, for you know, you're probably not touching. Not too many of your pixels are probably coming from 14th magnitude objects, right? 14th to 20th magnitude objects it's uh it's I, like I, I get down to uh 18th and 19th magnitude in any three minute shot okay so once so once there are a hundred and a hundred thousand new satellites up there then uh then yeah, you I know. might yep. you might have a hard time removing those we'll see i'm not giving up just because the silly people put too many satellites up <laughs> well fair enough well I'm sure there'll be some sort of uh, number of frames may double. So 80 frames and 160 frames to get a uh, usable image. We'll just have to see how that goes. And hopefully it's not a constant train that they all orbit in a specific area and get out of the way. Um, there's Well, I don't think they're not geostationary, though. Yeah. So they're going to be, it's going to be a constant train. Uh, Jeez. Yeah, but the thing is, is, is I get satellites every every time I'm taking images tonight, any, or every night, anyways. Sometimes, uh, in the three consecutive frames, three different satellites. But the the sigma clipping takes care of that. Um, I have a suggestion. I suggest that each side in this debate submit an article for publication in the WASP. All right, that's a great idea. Good question. Pat, 
Yeah, Bert. Love it. I love it. Absolutely. Good. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, Ken. Um, hey, can you elaborate on? Yes. You, made, you made the statement that humans don't belong in space. It almost sounds theistic. I'm just curious if you can elaborate. Why, why do you say that humans don't belong in space? Because the humans are not built for space. They were built for you for the Earth. They're not built to, to put them physiologically, and it's been proven continuously. You had uh, the Irwin situation with the heart situation, with the gravity situation. The, right. the point that it costs so much, this is what I'm saying, is it costs so much more to make it sure that a human is safe in space than it would okay. if you just took that money and you poured it into something. So, so really what, and get, really what you're saying is it's cost prohibitive. I think it's cost prohibitive I, more so than they don't, they, they humans don't belong yes. in space. That's what I'm saying. It's cost prohibitive compared to what okay. you could do otherwise to do the same stuff. For now, maybe we'll move to the point. I mean, it's uh, it's worth noting that Antarctica is millions, literally millions of times more livable than Mars, much less there. And uh, and we still don't have very many people living there. Um, even going to the moon, it's only 200,000 miles away for crying out loud. We're not talking about going 35 million. I mean, come on. <laughs> Seriously, that, that's a point, you know. Mars ain't the kind of place well, to raise your kids. That, <laughs> well, that is, it, those are wise words from a poet. What did you say there? I Say that again. I said, Mars ain't the place you want to raise your kids. I yeah. think that's a good way to cut the video, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You are. Good night, guys. You are. Hey, Doug, are you're you're gonna forgiven. Four hundred tonight. Right. 